Okay, welcome all to the Housing Affordability and Justice panel. We are so glad to have you all here. This is going to be a great panel. Um, the housing affordability crisis is one of the biggest policy issues in the air in the past few years. It's even reached the highest level of government with rent caps and zoning reforms being talked about by the president um, and both presidential candidates in various directions. Um, usually the debates in housing in the newspaper involve zoning fights. That's usually what you hear about. But we wanted this panel to focus on other housing policies and interventions that are very promising, but may not be getting as much airtime as questions about zoning policy changes. So here we have three we're going to spotlight today, social housing, tenant right to counsel, and community land trusts. And we have three great figures to speak about each, um, just to give little uh, quick introductions to each of them. Aura Prochovnik is the Director of Litigation and Policy at the Eviction Defense Collaborative in San Francisco, which in 2018 passed a landmark tenant right to counsel policy. So not only do we, we had it passed and we're now six years into it so we can see how tenant right to counsel works in action and there's still more advocacy around improving tenant right to counsel. We have Paul William, head of the Center for Public Enterprise, who is a leader on social housing policy and research. And we have Sherry Taylor, who is the executive director of the Durham Community Land Trustees. She is a real estate developer and practitioner in creating sustainable housing solutions for low and moderate income families, among many other things. So today is a buffet of ideas around housing. So to start this off, we're gonna let everyone give a little bit of an intro. Then we're going to go into Q&As a little bit from me, a little bit from you, the audience. If you want to drop your Q&As as it goes along in the chat or in the Q&A function, we'll make sure we get your questions to each of them. Let's kick this off with Aura. Uh, could you tell us a bit about Tenant Right to Counsel, what you experienced in uh, San Francisco with this model? You know, I'd love to hear more about the Eviction Defense Collaborative. I'm sure everyone across the audience would be interested. So Aura, kick us off. Right. Uh, so tenant right to counsel is exactly what its name implies. It is a government established funding for tenants to be represented in litigation involving s avoiding displacement from their housing. Uh, we um, sometimes refer to it as a civil Gideon. Gideon is the US Supreme Court case that established the right to be represented in criminal cases. And that's now fully accepted across the board as sort of a no-brainer that if somebody has been criminally prosecuted to have their rights vindicated, they have a right to be represented by an attorney. Well, often the stakes are much more severe in an eviction case than they might be in a low-level misdemeanor criminal case. If your housing is disrupted, if you're at risk of being displaced to the streets, uh, it shakes up your home, your family, your health care. Uh, it destroys the community with increased homelessness. So to provide some representation to people who are at risk of losing this basic human necessity, shelter is what we advocate for in the tenant right to counsel movement. Uh, there's a couple of sort of bullet points. I mentioned that it's a government commitment. Uh, it's that it should be publicly funded. We're not looking for a private funding of, through nonprofits. It ensures attorney el uh, representation for all eligible tenants and different jurisdictions define that eligibility differently. Here in San Francisco, we have the most encompassing right to counsel law. We have absolutely complete eligibility. There's no screen for income or zip code the way other municipalities sometimes do it. If a tenant receives court papers for eviction, we provide that representation. It's also crucial that it be full representation, not triage or brief service or advice and counseling. It means full scope representation by an attorney who handles all aspects of the case. And it primarily covers evictions. It might cover other related matters like subsidy terminations in the end would result in a displacement or in our jurisdiction loss of a rent control aspect of a housing. So we also expand it to be beyond evictions, but that's the heart of it. Um, it was first established in 2017 in New York uh, San Francisco followed quickly behind in 2018, and it's a growing trend now around the country with a number of cities and a few states fully 
excuse me, coming on, on board with this. Here in San Francisco, our right to counsel was created in 2018 with a voter passed initiative. So Proposition F provided for full scope representation of all San Francisco tenants who either were served with notices terminating tenancy or court eviction papers. There's a very small number of cases which are excluded. Uh, family matters, uh, those situations where the landlord and the tenant reside in the same unit, uh, foreclosed upon owners are excluded. Otherwise, all tenants who are being evicted from their homes are eligible for our services. Uh, our agency, the Eviction Defense Collaborative, has been around since the mid-90s, providing self-help assistance to litigants in court cases. But the nature of our agency changed completely after 2018 when we became the lead agency in the city's right to counsel program. So there are currently nine legal service organizations participating here in San Francisco. What we did to be up and running very quickly after the initiative passed, uh, the city funded us in 2019, and we immediately opened our doors, is we harnessed the already existing, fairly robust tenant advocacy structure in San Francisco. So we had a number of agencies who were already providing some form of assistance, and we just upgraded that assistance to full scope representation. Uh, by lead agency, what our task is, is we do a central screening and intake for the entire city and then refer out to an appropriate agency based on the demographic and needs of the tenants involved. So some of our age, we have um, the legal assistance for the elderly, as you might imagine, they assist senior citizens. We have our legal service corporation, Bay Area Legal Aid. They help the most financially impaired and subsidized tenants. We have um, a legal referral panel that works with people who are HIV positive and so on down the list. Our agency is the one of last resort. So either one of those other eight doesn't have capacity to take another case, or the client doesn't exactly match one of their demographic niches, we'll take the case and ensure that the client has full scope representation. I'll also share that we're not quite at the point where we're meeting the vision of Proposition F because of a lack of capacity in the system. So we are not giving full scope representation to every tenant in the door, Instead, we're utilizing a prioritization system. Those who are most marginalized are getting a guarantee of that representation, and others who are perhaps more able to navigate the system on their own are getting self-help, and then when they come to their court settlement conference, we'll assign a limited scope attorney. So we use what we call a vulnerability score when we do an intake to make that determination up front uh, to to really um, be more equitable in how we're sharing our capacity. But we're at the point now where 85% of the cases in San Francisco are going full scope, about 15% are going limited scope. Our success rate is something we're very proud of. Uh, we just did a report and study. So um, as was mentioned, we've been in existence six years, but we, we became funded in 2019 and about six months later, COVID hit. And the next four years were was a different universe with moratoriums and struggles. And that was all lifted. And we've just done a report looking at our most recent fiscal year. So the year of 22 through 23 has the first strong non-COVID statistics. And our success rate from those years is 92%. Uh, we define success as either keeping a tenant in their current home or navigating the lawsuit in such a way that we could settle that they have enough time and money to relocate to replacement housing. 92% uh, is amazing. Um, in the pre-right to counsel world in San Francisco, 80% of tenants were self-represented. Uh, that's true across the country. Our statistics match that most tenants represent themselves in these eviction cases. Most landlords have attorneys. Clearly not an equal power balance. And we've turned the statistics on success on their head. They're completely reversed from what they used to be pre-right to counsel. Um, a 92% success rate means that people who otherwise could have been rendered homeless are staying housed. Uh, housing justice work we see as racial justice work. It provides for more diversity in our city. It um, is something of a no-brainer when it comes to city funding in terms of how to sell this in your own areas. Uh, we, um, if you do the math at, at how we fund our program, it comes out to about $6,300 per, 
for a fully litigated case. Uh, you combine that cost per case with our high success rate um, and compare that to the cost of, of housing an otherwise homeless person. It's about fifty to seventy thousand dollars per year to shelter one homeless per person versus sixty three hundred dollars to litigate an eviction case. Uh, that's ignoring the uh, sort of the less obvious costs of the emotional harm, the stress, the disruption that an eviction would cause, but just looking at the dollar and cents from a city government perspective, uh, it's one-tenth of the cost to avoid displacement by having a right to counsel, and it's the right thing to do. Um, so I think I will pause at this point, but I'm happy to answer any questions about our program as we run it in San Francisco or some of the work that we've done across the country. Wonderful. Thank you, Aura. Um, please throw questions in the chat. Aura can get back to you in the chat. We'll also have time at the end to do in-person questions. There's a chat. Put them in the chat or put them in the Q&A section. Let's move on to our second policy. So that's tenant right to counsel. One of the best ways to keep housing affordable is to keep people in their homes. Um, next up is a really interesting model of housing affordability among all many other benefits, which is the community land trust model. And we have a great practitioner here in Sherry Taylor of Durham, North Carolina. Sherry, over to you. And Sherry, you said you were going to share some slides. And just one thing, when you click share, I've been told by the tech team, um, you should click share screen, not share slides. Okay, great. great. All right, good afternoon, everybody. So great to be here with you. We're gonna to try to make this technology work. Um, we'll see what happens. Um, I'm trying to make it work, but it doesn't It doesn't wanna to seem to, to cooperate with me today, unfortunately. You're clicking uh, share in the bottom right? I am, and I'm clicking on screen, and then it doesn't, it doesn't do anything, so. Maybe we could try slides, see if that works. Or... Let's try slides. While that's importing or doing whatever it's going to do, uh, I'll just start. Uh, Durham Community Land Trustees is located in Durham, North Carolina, so we're located in the south. And we're the third oldest land trust in the United States that's still operating. And so we've been doing this since 1987. And the community land trust model, um, I don't know if it's showing, but um, the community land trust model is really interesting. It really uh, formed out of trying to get rights for black tenant farmers. So the first community land trust that's recognized in the United States and really in the world uh, was formed in Albany, Georgia in the late 60s and it's called New Communities Incorporated. And um, if you know anything about sharecropping, it's very predatory, it keeps people in poverty, and certainly you don't own anything. And so the community land trust model was created to give folks the opportunity to um, own a property, but also take that property out of the uh, normal real estate market and make sure that it stays um, in, in the community. Um, and so what we provide is is really rental housing and um, home ownership for sale homes for low and moderate income families. And we define that as for home ownership, 80% AMI, uh, area median income or below. And for rental, 60% um, AMI or below. At this point in our history, we provide both. Um, we have housing for the general public, housing for seniors, for veterans, supportive housing. And so we're able to do this um, through a couple different ways. Um, single family homes, duplexes, triplexes, um, quads, and uh, apartment complexes. You know, a land trust can own any sort of property. It's whatever the community needs. In our case, most of our land trust holdings are residential. But like I said, a community land trust can own commercial property for small business. They can own um, land that's supposed to be protected, like beachfront property, farms, 
it's whatever your particular community needs. So I know y'all are from all across the country. And um, if you want to try out this land trust idea, it's great. At this point um, in the U.S., there's over 300 um, community land trusts all across the country. I'm sure there are one in, in almost every state. Um, and you may be wondering, what's the difference between a regular land trust and the community land trust? Well, the community is the piece that is um, very important here. Um, our, our nonprofit board is one third, you know, tenants and homeowners, one third people who actually live in the neighborhoods that we serve, and then one third open to the general public. That means all the development that we do is community led. Those are my bosses, right? And so that's what makes a CLT different from a different type of, of land trust. We really are um, run by community members. At this point in DCLT's history, we have over 315 rental units. Most of those are managed in-house. Uh, we serve 53 land trust homeowners. We have two community gardens and most of our portfolio is scattered site. So um, single family homes, duplexes, that sort of thing. We specialize in urban infill. Some land trusts are in rural areas, so they won't be doing that. But we're in an urban area, we take vacant lots and we put housing on it. Um, that has a dual benefit of, of course, providing an affordable unit or units, but also the community revitalization piece. Um, I've lived in Durham for 18 years and I've seen it change um, over that time. And, you know, community land trusts, if, if, you're, if your community is what is, you know, kind of um, not so, your real estate market is not so hot, this is a perfect time to start a land trust. Because we've seen in Durham where, you know, 20 years ago, we could buy a lot for $20,000. And now that same lot is going for 145. Um, it's really hard for people to stay here. So we started out as a revitalization and housing organization trying to provide more units. But at this point, we're still doing that. But the land trust also serves as a anti-displacement strategy, anti-gentrification strategy. You know, our goal is to have permanently affordable housing and housing that creates neighborhoods that are diverse, economically, racially, religiously, and ethnically. And the only way you can really do that is that you have permanently affordable housing. So how does this work? Well, when we have a land trust home that's for sale, we only sell the structure. We do not sell the land. And each time that home is resold to another buyer, we get back in the transaction and we make sure that it's sold to another low or moderate income family, right? And so some of our homes have resold three and four times at this point. We know the model works and um, it's really helpful. Uh, we've seen the way it can restrain um, the housing costs. Uh, recently, we had a house appraised for $420,000. Because of the land trust model, it was affordable for another LMI family to uh, buy, and it sold for two hundred and eleven thousand. Uh, that was that's within our eighty percent AMI for our area. Um, you know, the housing that we provide is not you know out in a greenfield somewhere. Like I said, we're in an urban area. We're in the urban core, um, right near downtown. Jobs, transit, healthcare, uh, where people actually want to be and in walkable neighborhoods. And so while the home prices in our area are, you know, $500,000, $600,000, we have land trust homeowners who are buying in the 200s or less, and they're in those same neighborhoods. Um, I can say that when people buy one of our homes, even if it's a, a resale or we're continuing to do new construction, of course, because we're developers, um, they're really getting an amazing value and, you know, being able to be rooted. These are neighborhoods that um, people grew up in, their families have been in for generations, and they're finding themselves not being able to buy here and stay here. 
Um, and so that is a great model for um, housing affordability, anti-displacement, gentrification, anti-gentrification measures. Uh, com community land trust can really be whatever your community needs. Uh, but we do know that there are, you know, some groups that are more vulnerable to displacement, um, people of color, renters, those under 80% AMI, households with children in poverty, and people with a bachelor's degree or less. And so this is exactly, um, those are exactly the people that we serve um, with the community land trust. And I'm just gonna leave it there because I know there'll be a lot of questions about it, but it is certainly a model um, that is in the toolbox for affordability, um, especially when it comes to home ownership. There's not a lot of tools in the toolbox for home ownership and the community land trust model does provide one of them. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Sherry. Let's go to our third, um, I, and apologies for the slide situation. Um, we're still working on it with Crowdcast. Uh, it's our first year with this new platform. Um, let's go to our third and final alternative policy um, here for housing affordability. Over to Paul talking about social housing. Hi, everybody. I'm going to see if it will let me share. Is that working? It's a miracle. <laughs> did that? Okay. Um, okay. Something, maybe it's uh, something. I don't know how it. it happened, but it did. So uh, we'll roll with it. So uh, thanks for having me here today. My name is Paul Williams. I'm the executive director at the Center for Public Enterprise. Uh, we're an organization that works with public agencies on um, programs that they can design and implement and, and run that um, uh, increase opportunities for the public sector to be more actively involved in, in economic development. We do work on energy, but we also do a lot of work on housing. So working with public housing authorities and state housing finance agencies um, uh, on ways to build more affordable housing. So I'll, I'll kind of go into this uh, model that we work with here, just a second. Okay, um, so there's a growing interest from, from state housing finance agencies and public housing authorities around the country uh, to create programs that they can run themselves um, that don't require federal uh, subsidies from Congress to build additional affordable housing. Because the main constraint today in, in basically every state is the amount of low income housing tax credits and vouchers that Congress gives your state each year is the amount of affordable housing um, that's going to get built that year um, in terms of uh, multifamily rental. And so tools that allow uh, public agencies to finance more affordable housing on top of that are uh, are really the name of the game. And so we've worked with a number of public housing authorities that have created some innovative um, public development models um, that utilize income mixing um, and revolving loan funds to allow them to do additional affordable housing development on top of all of the important work they already do with the subsidies that Congress gives them every year. Um, so I'll get a little bit into the technicals on that and and um, a little bit into um, you know what constraints might be for states and, and what the opportunities are. So the basic premise on on the financing is if you've already, you know, say you've spent all the money that Congress gave you one year. Uh, do you sit on your hands for the rest of the year as an agency, or do you um, create new uh, vehicles for doing additional development on top of that? This revolving loan fund concept for construction financing is one tool that has taken, uh, you know, fire across the country. And and you know, I think five years ago there was a one agency who was starting to do this. Now there's over a dozen agencies um, that are implementing or exploring this idea um, of capitalizing a revolving loan fund and using that for a kind of short-term construction financing um, tool. I won't get too into the technicals since I know that's not the, the um, key here today, but happy to answer questions if anyone has them. Um, this 
again, technical, just, you know, showing what the kind of capital stack looks like and how it's different from a conventional low income housing tax credit building. Um, we want to give you a couple of examples too. So Montgomery County, Maryland, their public housing authority um, is called the Housing Opportunities Commission of Montgomery County. And these are uh, a couple of projects that they've built or are currently being built um, using this program. So the one on the left um, was the first project and this one's built and leased up and um, it was actually written about in the New York Times um, last year. And so this is publicly developed, publicly owned, mixed income. Um, and and I, the key is they did it on top of um, what they already do with their congressional subsidies. So they didn't need to use um, uh, any congressional funding for this one. They were able to do it you know, on their own balance sheet, um, on their own terms. Um, and then this one on the right is another project uh, that um, is under construction right now. Um, and this one, uh, this facility is going to be the first net zero multifamily building in the state of Maryland. So showing that um, public agencies can really lead on these innovative clean energy um, apartments as well. Um, and then here's another example uh, from Atlanta where the city of Atlanta has created in, in partnership with Atlanta's Housing Authority um, a, a mixed income uh, development program. Um, and here's a couple of examples uh, of projects they're working on. One is uh, uh, they have a um, old fire station and parking lot in Midtown Atlanta, um, and they have created kind of a an innovative RFQ process um, to uh, uh, select partners to turn that into a public development. Um, and then on the right, um, there's a former public housing site um, that was unfortunately uh, torn down many years ago. And now uh, they have an opportunity with this new program um, to redevelop it using this mixed income public development tool. Um, just quick, we'll run through uh, opportunities and potential issues um, for housing finance agencies or public housing authorities. The opportunities are, again, this is a dish, this is a tool that allows additional affordable housing production on top of um, the subsidies that uh, that already exist. Um, and it doesn't require an ongoing appropriation like those tools like the tax credit and 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 vouchers. Um, uh, it also allows for long term public stewardship. So this is permanent affordability. This is not tax credit 15 year or renewal for 30 year affordability. Um, and then there's flexible implementation. There's a lot of different jurisdictions with a lot of different contexts that are exploring this. And um, there's ways to adapt a model like this uh, for a lot of different places. Um, and then needs, uh, obviously a, a one-time appropriation to seed a revolving loan fund is something that state legislators can do to support these kinds of programs. Um, and then other considerations are some public housing authorities or housing finance agencies might have statutory constraints on the type of activity um, they're allowed to do, including development or ownership and um, ability to serve different ranges of incomes. So those are just some things to flag. Um, and that's all I had on slides. So um, I'll try and keep it short. I'll cut it there. Uh, and. Uh, would love to hear if there are any questions. This is wonderful. Thank you, Paul, um, Sherry, Ora, and Paul. Thank you for presenting um, these three great models. Um, you know, one, I someone contacted me and they said, you know, I, I've been referring to these as alternatives, and they're not alternatives to each other. All three of these can be done. I meant alternatives to the dominant status quo where most tenants don't have lawyers, most houses are not publicly developed, most developers are not public developers, and most houses are not part of a community land trust. These are alternatives to that that can lead to wonderful policy outcomes that can all be implemented uh, in your state. Um, uh, you know, uh, so, you know, why don't we, um, 
you know, we talked a bit about the model of each. You know, I want people dropping things in the Q&A and we'll get to those in a second. Um, quick answer on one Q&A question. We'll make sure to get these slides emailed out to all participants in Statehouse Futures, including Sherry's slides. Um, and, uh, but why don't I have each of you go around, we have about seven minutes left of, um, you know, you've described the model, but why don't we, could we also describe kind of your journey in advocating for this? What has been kind of the biggest tip you have in getting the ball rolling? Let's say someone out there, one of our audience members today is saying, oh my gosh, I want to bring this to my state. I want to bring this to my state. What have you learned that would be a good first tip? And we have about kind of two minutes for each of you to share. So why don't we start with Sherry? Well, besides having, you know, local and state support, I think what's really helped us is that on the, the state level is that we have state enabled legislation uh, to support community land trust homes. And what that does is that allows our county tax assessors to actually assess land trust homes at a lower tax rate that helps people afford the homes. I, you know, typically your taxes are folded into your escrow, into your mortgage. And so by doing that, um, it makes the homes more affordable over time. Not every state has that, and so that it's not available to every land trust, but it's an additional benefit that our home buyers get. And again, in our state, it had to come from the state level. So that's how the state supported um, and continues to support land trust home ownership. Of course, there's other things that can be done to get started. Um, but really you have to build that local support. Our organization was created by a group of neighbors who saw this model and wanted it to, to, to happen. But other land trusts have been started by municipalities and by counties. And those typically have a lot more money to start. And then they kind of um, spin off into their own separate nonprofit. Either way is completely fine, but you still need that education and community support because it's a different type of real estate. And so when people hear, oh my goodness, I'm not going to own the land, a lot of negative feelings can come up, especially uh, amongst people of color. But once they understand that it's to actually get someone to be able to buy in a very high cost area or before it becomes a high cost area and the model is explained, that's where you get the strength to you and the support to really push the model forward. People have to understand how it actually works. Thank you, Sherry. Same question to you, Aura. And we actually got a Q&A about something you mentioned. It was about determining the vulnerability score when you're triaging how to get lawyers. Um, how do you ensure equity among racial groups? How do you kind of work with youth and young adults that face chronic homelessness, juvenile justice impacted? Um, if you want to answer that and also kind of give a quick answer as well on, um, you know, what advice you have to get tenant right to counsel off the ground in your neck of the woods. Um, sure, I'll, I'll try to take a stab at both of those questions. Uh, in terms of getting it off the ground, I'll echo a lot of what Sherry said, which is really uh, garnering your community support. Uh, you need to do this either through your legislature, so really doing some education in your city council or a state legislative body. And also um, in San Francisco, we created this through a voter-driven initiative. So it can be done by the popular vote uh, uh, proposition process. Uh, it's um, There was very little opposition to our proposition considering how much money is often spent on tenant advocacy propositions that we put on the ballot because really this is just what's fair and just and that's how you just want to put it out. It's very hard to oppose having people have an equal shot at having a, a representation in court. And I'll just reiterate what I said earlier. One of the best tools to prevent homelessness is if somebody's already in a home, keep them in it. Uh, it's, it's just so much more cost effective and it's so much more humane to follow that route. Uh, another tip is just to look at your already existing tools. So there's the PD model where the government itself could be the representative in the agency, but that's much more costly. So we took the already existing structure of having 10 advocacy 
agencies and just increase their funding so they could do this full scope representation. In terms of our vulnerability score, uh, we use the type of criteria that you might imagine one would use. So we look, we, basically we give people a point system for being elderly or disabled, either physically or mental health challenges, uh, having minor children in the home, having a subsidy, language barriers, uh, long-term tenancies get extra scoring in part because of our rent control system, subsidized housing, history of domestic violence that might be impacting the litigation, uh, incarceration issues. Uh, and you know, normally you wouldn't want a really high score with those kinds of factors, but the, the higher the score, the more that we guarantee the referral and the lower the score instead will provide self-help representation and guide them through the process. So we feel that's more equitable than just first one in the door gets the case and then using up the capacity with not looking at that type of prioritization. Thank you, Aura. We only have about 30 seconds left. So Paul, I dropped in the chat how to hear about Sherry's work and Aura's work, but I'll let you have the last word on um, how do people hear about your work um, and how they can bring you in to help with public development in their neck of the woods. Yeah, um, you, you know, I, I, the thing that I say when when um, legislators and, and other advocates reach out about how to do this in their state is um, really it starts with having conversations with the housing authority and your housing finance agency. And I, I think there's a, um, a lot of times people will think that there might be resistance to an idea like this. Uh, but in fact, those agencies really do. They want opportunities to build more affordable housing. Um, and if you bring them workable solutions, they will be eager to uh, find a way to implement. That's been my experience uh, every single time. So that's what I would say. Thank you, Paul. Thank you, Aura. Thank you, Sherry. What a wonderful buffet of exciting housing models and ideas. Let's go fight for housing justice and housing affordability in our states. Everyone's about to be sucked back into the keynote. Um, the system will bring you in there on its own. They're about to press the button. Um, and we dropped a bunch of links in the chat to learn more about Paul, Aura, and Sherry's work. Thank you so much. Uh, keep up the good fight. And we're headed to the keynote.